Greetings from Sydney. On behalf of the CIB student chapter at Western Sydney University and the Center for Smart Modern Construction, I extend a warm welcome to everybody who is joining us today from across the globe for our first fireside chat, Collective Sense Making. I also welcome my colleague, Amir. Uh, we will be your host for tonight. Hi, Amir. Thanks, Priya. Today, we have with us two incredibly successful and high achieving professionals who are role models of leadership, resilience, and determination. But before we introduce our guests tonight, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we have gathered on today and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our first guest for tonight, Professor Kira Matus. So welcome, Professor Kira. Professor Matus's primary research focus is at the intersection of innovation, sustainability science, and public policy, focusing on sustainable production consumption systems. A large portion of her research is on how policy interacts with the development and implementation of green technologies in supply chains. She researches how policy can incentivize innovation, but also at how innovation can feed back into policy. Professor Matus is currently an associate professor at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and associate head of division of public policy. Before moving to Hong Kong, she held positions as a senior lecturer in innovation and sustainability in the Department of Science, Technology and Public Policy at UCL and as an assistant professor in the Department of Government at the London School of Economics. She has a PhD in public policy from Harvard University, a master's in technology and policy from MIT, and bachelor's from Brown University. Professor Matus, it's an honor for us to have you here tonight. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to speak with you all. Our second guest tonight is Christina Seven. She's gonna be here. First, yeah. Welcome, Christina. Christina is the founder and managing director and BYs, an international consultancy firm specialized in startups and SME to scale up and bring new technology into construction market. Christina has over 20 years experience in civil engineering technology industries and played a key role as a transport manager of the Greenwich Park uh, Avenue during the London Olympic Games. She then moved to a work for a multinational leading technology company, Autodesk, covering several global roles as a technical and commercial lead across Europe and America. Christina holds an MBA from the University of Cambridge, a joint degree in transport and business management from Mir College of London and UCL, and a first class degree in environmental economics. Christina is a regular speaker at international industry events and a regular columnist for AACBusiness.com. Here in Australia, she's part of the National Work Group for the Digital Build and Legal Environment and the Australia BIM Advisory Board. Christina, welcome on board. Welcome guests. It's a privilege to be with us today, the Dean of the School of Built Environment, Professor Mike Caglioglu, and the Director of the Center for Smart Modern Construction, Professor Srinath Pereira. Professor Mike, now he's in. Yep, he's joining yeah. in. Uh, thank, prof uh, thank Professor Mike for taking time out of your busy schedule and being with us tonight. And without further ado, could I request you to say a few words and welcome our guests tonight. Thank you very much, Amr, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, wherever you are uh, in the world. Um, a very warm welcome to this uh, very significant event. Uh, it signifies the establishment of the center for three years now under the leadership of uh, Professor Pereira, but also one year since the establishment of the CAB student chapter. And can I just start by congratulating all the students for the efforts that they're uh, putting uh, together to try and create a, a very dynamic environment with global exposure for the work the, of the center, but also of our students and, and the work that they're performing. So big, big congratulations. And a very warm welcome to Kira and Christina as well. Uh, I understand both of you have passed through the UK, uh, where uh, <laughs> I've been uh, working in for most of my uh, working life. So it's lovely to 
to see you both. And I very much look forward to listening to you and learning from uh, what you have to share. And um, I do hope that uh, this ends up being one of those events where we would all remember in a few years time because we started working together and uh, are doing interesting stuff. So uh, a warm welcome and I very much look forward to um, the presentations and congratulations to all involved. Thank you, Professor. Um, I now request Professor Srinath Pereira, the director for the Center for Smart Modern Construction, to tell us a little about the inspiration behind collective sense making. Thank you, Priya. Thank you, Priya, and thank you, uh, Ame. Uh, what a wonderful event you have organized. It's really good to see this. During COVID-19, we had to learn how to live differently. To learn work, socialize, and collaborate in different ways. And many of us are doing that already in a virtual environment. The pandemic is therefore a watershed moment for the digital transformation of business. The rules for success have changed and are ever more reliant on harnessing the power of digital models and collective intelligence to create new value and experiences. The CIB student chapter and the Center for Smart Modern Construction has always been about non-traditional approaches and what better way to create value than collective sense making. Thank you, Mira and Christina for being with us today. And I think we can start now. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Mike, and thank you, Prof. Sarnath, for welcoming our guests. Now, the beautiful guests are all our Priya. That's great. Uh, so we will kickstart our discussion right away. Uh, Hira and Christina, welcome on board. My first question would be for Hira. So what do you think uh, the great reset post COVID-19 will mean for society, for policy and regulations? That's a hugely broad question. Um, and I think it's one we've already seen a lot of discussion on, but a few thoughts that I, I had on this. The first is that I think one of the interesting things from the perspective of a policy and technology scholar is that this is forcing us to rethink a lot of our assumptions we've had for the last 20 or 30 years about what it is that governments do, should do, and are needed for. That um, a lot more discussion of, of governments as being a key element and government policies being a key element in societal resilience is really coming to the fore, right? So we've seen that places that have robust public health infrastructures are having significantly different experiences than places that don't, for example, or that are able to help support their communities through shutdowns versus those that don't. And so I think that this has, uh, perhaps not for everyone, but in a lot of places, begun to shift discussions. So, you know, I'm an American and you know, trust in government and, and uh, has been very bad <laughs> and very low, but there's been a long, you know, probably almost my entire lifetime has been you know, the government is kind of an incompetent, uh, problematic actor in the social space has been a lot of the discussion. And, and this, is, this is beginning to, sh I think, shift some of the policy discussions into saying, actually, when it comes to this type of problem, they are not the only actor, but such an important one. So from a policy perspective, I think that it is reopening discussions about the different ways that you require different sorts of social policy. I mean, even in Hong Kong, where we don't necessarily have a lot of a, much at all of a welfare state, right? We've had to have all kinds of interventions to keep people to keep people going. And so this is this is going to change, I think, people's approach to policy for resiliency as opposed to policy being about improving efficiency of services, right? Now we need to be thinking about resiliency of services, kind of to to um, latch onto our theme. I think we're also, of course, going to see, and we're already seeing reconsiderations of some trends about where we live, how we live, who we live with, right? The idea of increasingly small households, uh, not physically connected to other members of family or friends or community, all of a sudden seems like a much less viable, uh, resilient structure than it might have two years ago. Uh, so you might see potentially changes in patterns of, of pe what people want out of urban space, where people choose to settle, Regulatory, I mean, it depends which direction or what kinds of spaces you're talking about. I do think in the digital space, we're going to see a lot of tension between privacy demands and social good demands, right? So we're seeing this with the various COVID tracker apps. 
um, where we, on the one hand, have these potentially fabulous tools for public health, but on the other have very real concerns about this increased digitalization on privacy. And the same thing, if I'm running all of my courses, all of my student work, everything is going you know, virtual across the web, all of a sudden we have a whole huge range of issues we may need to deal with, uh, how we do verification of all, you know, even just down to getting people to agree to have e-signatures on things. I mean, we're in Hong Kong, we're very formal, we still use fax machines sometimes. And so getting people to accept things like e-signatures in a regulatory context has been, you know, also say, like, oh my goodness, what are we gonna do? So I think there's a lot of, of tension there about how we can balance what we need or think we need to do with technology with also still having built in some of those protections. I mean, I, there'll be other issues I think coming forward, but for this discussion, that's that's the big one I saw. And And I think generally we're seeing a new awareness around vulnerability. Uh, in places or amongst people who might not have been thinking about that before. I come from sustainability, so we've been screaming this from the rafters for goodness knows how long, uh, but maybe perhaps now, you know, more than just for the two weeks after every major typhoon that we see, that the idea that vulnerability and resilience are things we need to be taking seriously uh, is, is catching on a bit. But once again, I, I always feel like we're doing this and we're looking into a crystal ball, and who knows, I mean, in a year you might all, all be look at me and say, mm, we just rebounded back the way we always do. But I th do think some of these trends are going to have an impact for a long time. Okay, actually, interesting and international answer, uh, Kara. So <laughs> I come to you, Christina, and uh, it will be the same question, but like, what do you think, again, uh, like from the Great Reset, but what that mean to the construction industry perspective? Um, yes, sure. So Kira already, you know, introduced, you know, some of the topics, but um, from my perspective, you know, we've already, you know, touched um, on some of the, you know, what is happening right now. We are dealing with something that no one has dealt before and we have to change what we're doing. Um, you know, in every day, I'm, you know, and we're talking about resilience, um, I'm joining you from, my, from lockdown Melbourne. <laughs> Something definitely I would never have thought, you know, I was going to deal a year ago this week when I moved to Melbourne. So, <laughs> and, um, and um, you know, it's, um, it's, it, it's a new world. It's a new world and for the construction, the digital construction industry, which is the space I've been mostly working on. I focus and I work a lot with the early stage startups and, SMEs, the products for the construction life cycle to digitalize, digitalize that space. And what is happening in the last part from the first few months, uh, which there was, you know, this bit of like complete reset, nobody was, you know, it was a new world for everyone. But now you can really see how everyone is saying, well, we have to deal with this. What are we going to do? And certainly in the last few months, has seen a completely different focus for an industry that we know why it's been lagging and we know why it's very, very difficult to adopt innovation uh, because often because of the policy side and it always takes time and to translate that from the regulatory point of view. And, um, and also, you know, we are so risk adverse. Why are we going to test? Are we really going to try to do something that never to be tested before? Who wants to be the first? Is it going to bring more damage and what's been, you know, and then benefits it's um it's always that balance is always that benefits but definitely from the digital space i mean and the digital construction and trying to innovate uh, you know the industry i think this is the biggest opportunity that the industry ever had this is our opportunity to bring the innovation which there is no way we can, you know, afford to build, you know, the, the world and maintain what we, you know, all our built assets unless we bring this much needed innovation. So we have the right excuse to, uh, to bring, you know, uh, the, the innovation and to push it ahead and try, you know what, try and test it. The reality is we can't keep doing what we were doing. We somehow have to change, right? So it's, um, I think what I can see is, you know, the, the great reset is definitely a focus on we have to do more with less. And if it's, you know, 
any type of technology, anything that speeds up the life cycle, anything that can be helpful, anything that brings collaboration, anything that, you know, we would have seen, of course, there is the big trust and, you know, issue and, and um, how we're going to bring, you know, how can we trust uh, for example, I, you know, I wrote, uh, I, as I say, um, I introduced me, I write these articles and I run my own column on acbusiness.com and I was discussing um, last weekend on how we're going to bring trust on construction sites. How can we trust, you know, to make this, you know, um, you know, survey and can we actually verify what's happening through a camera? Is it not be too easy to hide what we don't want you to see can understand so there are all of these um you know new elements that we're now bringing and on the digital obviously um space is bringing especially you know, in terms of security and what we're going to do with this data can we really you know trust someone to act from off site on something that is you know we've been we are in a new space i think from someone that's been working on this space for quite some time, you know, we've been seeing this type of technology been testing for some time. Has it really been implemented across the life cycles? I think I would say some success stories, but not throughout. And I think this is the opportunity for, for us now to just come up with some very, very, very use, you know, cases and some really great opportunities to, um, and, Yes, and bring the much needed innovation to the industry. Perfect. Uh, I totally connect with what you said, and what I take away from your uh, answer is that uh, we have to do more with less, and trust has to be somewhere in the picture, and trust enabled through technology, and and that's something that the Center for Smart Modern Construction is working heavily with. So, which we might discuss at later conversations, but moving to you, Kira, again. Um, so, this is going to be another broad question, of course, but how is the definition of resilience changing? Are we resilient? If not, how is the definition changing post COVID, you know, and how can innovation aid in being resilient? I don't think the definition of resilience is changing. I think our valuation of resilience is changing. Mm -hmm. I think we've spent a very long time prizing efficiency over all else to the point where our systems have become brittle, right? Look how quickly in the UK, right? Everyone's like, oh, people were food hoarding, the shelves were empty. Actually, it was only a five, it was a basically the food increase you would expect on purchasing if no one is eating lunch out and thinks they're gonna have to cook for themselves for two weeks, right? And it made a huge mess of a just-in-time food delivery system, um, right? So there. When, when they looked at the data, it wasn't so much that people were hoarding food, it's that our system was, yeah, the, the supermarkets are going to be so efficient and we're carrying so little backstock that, that we can't, we had nothing when we were stressed, right? And so this idea of, of just increasingly, like, on the one hand, it's tricky, right? Because on the one hand, now we're in a situation where we need to do more with less, but we're also seeing that we can't do so much more with less that we leave ourselves with no flexibility, that we don't have any backstock that we are that if we don't get our part just in time, the whole system comes to a grinding halt, right? And so I think that one of the things innovation can help with is trying to do a better job of managing the balance between the resilience of our systems and the efficiency of our systems and figuring out how we can best use our resources, right? Where are the places where we need to spend or pay a little bit more to make sure that we don't have interruption because that kind of the interruptions are so costly, right? Yeah. Versus the things that we can be, you know, a little bit more flexible on. And, and I think that once again, so th the idea is that resilience or how we, how we, how we talk about resilience, the definition hasn't changed, but the importance of it is much clearer now, I think than it was. So people who are saying for a long time, you know, we're looking a little brittle, like people, I, I come from a kind of a tradition of systems analysts, right? And so we look at these things and we're like, we see some like bad potential here with with some of these, you know, the way the way the networks look and the, and the supply chains look and and unfortunately we weren't necessarily wrong. But I think one of the, then the thing is that innovation we have a lot more tools, right? Because now we can see, we can visualize, we can map supply chains in ways you know that we couldn't necessarily do it before. Um, and so I think innovation is really going to help us manage that trade off uh, much much better. At least that's my hope. Um, 
And so the other thing too, is I think that it's very important that we see technology and innovation as supporting actors, right? So I think one of the temptations is to say, oh, okay, we just gotta like make all these new cool fancy things to get out of it. And I don't think that unalloyed technological enthusiasm is gonna get us any, is gonna, is gonna fix it. That, that you always figure out what is the goal, right? What is it gonna take to make us resilient? What do we actually have on the table that we can use maybe in different ways first before we have to start, you know, there's gonna be a lot of untested technologies we need to use, but we may actually have some good ideas or even old ideas that can come back. And that technology allows us to do these things better. But technology won't fix us if we don't understand the problems or we don't know what the goals are or we don't know why we're using it. So the, the flip side of that is that I would hate to see this turn into the like, we're gonna just start chasing shiny new things and we're gonna AI-ify everything because AI sounds cool because that's not gonna fix it, right? Um, as much as there are people out there who would like to say it's going to fix it's not going to fix it. It's just going to create its own new set of challenges, right? Christina's agreeing. She knows exactly. Yes, what exactly. I, um, yeah, it's actually great if you don't mind. I'll, um, you know, but Kira, you are, you know, per perfectly, I think, spot on on that. And I think that is the issue, um, you know, on what's coming, you know, what's going to happen next. It is going to be a revolution or revolution, yeah? What is really, what are we going to, you know, what we're going to witness. And um, because the, the issue is we can have, a, um, you know, there is a lot already of technology out there. And I think one of the downsides now is trying to reinvent something that actually already exists and trying to double it up. Because it's, um, well, when I, one of the things that I find fascinating is the amount of people that come to me and say, oh, great, I have this great idea. And I was like, yeah, without your research, if you, you know how many people actually really try to do that? Why are you not learning from that? Why are you restarting again? And I think this is, you know, some of the problems and some of it, I had one particular company, so, oh, you know what? We just put some money and we're gonna start developing our own stuff because we couldn't find anything on the market. Could you? No, really? Are you sure? The technology is already there. Maybe is the issue that we have, which the knowledge sharing the knowledge sharing in the market that is not as good. And unfortunately, what happens is we don't see it in the big companies because it takes some time before the small companies get acquired and this type of technology becomes like, you know, like mainstream. But those um, type of technology often, they do exist. They're just developing in small pockets and they just haven't come out yet. And I think might be the, the, the way I see it is, um, I think maybe with the COVID, it's going to be the revolution that we need if we start sharing, you know, those opportunities. We start sharing, you know, not start to reinventing and yes, the buzzword and yes, let's do AI. I, I really, do, can we really trust it to that point, you know, and what, what do we want to achieve? And, and I think, yes, I'm completely, you know, with you on that regards that it's, um, it's a big, you know, debate and a big balance on trying what do we want to achieve with the implement and adoption of that new technology. Yeah, actually, this is, was in our agenda that the uh, upcoming question for you, Christina, regarding if you think that digital transformation right now in construction specifically, it's evaluation or revolution. But I believe to some extent, you know, your response. I mean, this question, okay, but. Uh, because I mean, sometimes okay, like uh, it's still I mean, some like we feel even from industry or academia, academia, some of them they act with this digital transformation and evaluation. Some of them, as you mentioned, okay, looking to that as a revolution. So if you can elaborate more about that specifically in construction industry. Yeah, you know what? It's um, it's um, it's difficult. I don't have only one point of view in the sense that I think in some areas we are going to have and we can witness a natural evolution. And for yeah. some companies, it's going to be an evolution on the path and the digital transformation that they already started. The revolution, I think, is going to be in those perhaps companies that have not really put much effort, they have to completely transform. And perhaps that it's really where they, we might gonna see you know the witness but then at the same time i was having this debate with um with having discussion i'm part of um, this research um 
project um, uh, building, you know, 4.0. So I was talking to head of research um, and at Lendlease, and we were talking about, you know, the, the dead horse theory. Mm. Are we riding this dead horse that actually there is no point in trying, you know, to evolve and shall we just dismount, you know? And I think there might be some, you know, elements and I know there are some, a lot of discussions put it on uh, how we procure those, um, you know, the, the built up, our built assets. I know there is, you know, in UK has been working, you know, a lot on this and, you know, I keep seeing it. Do we want to, you know, perhaps it's time we completely change, you know, is, is, can you say, it's not giving us what, the, you know, what we want to achieve and, you know, it's outdated and, you know, perhaps it's time, you know what, we just find a new way to, yeah. um, to, um, you know, to source those, you know, build assets, to procure those build assets that perhaps, you know, does not bring these huge, huge contrasts and debates and, you know, and uh, challenging between, you know, we don't have X and OPEX and, you know, how at the moment we still don't know how, to, you know, to bring the two together and completely different, you know, set of goals. And so, you know, there is a lot of, so can we procure in a completely different way if the benefits are long term, you know, and so on. So I think we're going to probably, you know, to answer your questions, all three and evolution, revolution, and we're probably going to see maybe some people dismounting the dead horse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but before, before uh, Bria back to Kerry, okay, uh, uh, Professor, Professor Mike and Professor uh, Sunat, at any time, you feel that there is something, I know that there's a lot of uh, things to say, but if you feel like there is something interesting to tell us, okay, just jump ahead. We'll try to keep, I mean, the focus on Kara and uh, Christina, but if there's anything, okay, absolutely come. Back to you, Bria. Perfect. I totally connect with you, Christina. This is what uh, we are also trying to do as a part of our research project at the center. We're trying to map the maturity of the organizations as Industry 4.0, uh, you know, came into or started disrupting construction. And now we have another element called COVID-19 and, and how that will kind of affect if, if some companies are going to evolve or totally it's going to be a revolution and you know completely transform so i think we are aligning in our our, our respective uh, works but now i'll get back to you professor Matus. and i know you said it's not a tech fix always it has to be all the other elements combined together but if we had to talk of the technology trajectories because that is something that you're working on so if, if we're talking about the technology trajectories, what are those technologies that you think are going to become critical post COVID in the Great Reset? Yeah, I've been, you sent me this question. I've been struggling with this for a while. I mean, I think we obviously, you know, we can talk about communications technologies, but is that so different from where we already were, right? Um, we can talk about AI, but that's also been, you know, streaming along for a while. Um, you know, so, so, you know, once again, I think that it's going to come down to how people creatively use a lot of the technologies that we're already um, kind of kind of hopping along with. And but I, I I really struggle to come up with one or two or three things where I'm like, this is exactly what it's going to be because frankly, I think we're still in the thick of it. Um, I think actually there's going to be a lot of interesting stuff coming out of the health technology space. I think potentially the changes to vaccine. Uh, an infectious disease work is going to be quite fascinating, which is a you know a totally different topic for a totally different set of experts on a totally different set of days. But I think that um, a lot of things around how we deal with with public health and youth, but I think it's going to come a lot to see. I think it might be combinatorial. Um, so I study a lot of different technology sectors, and and one of the really interesting things is how technologies combine. And so it's very hard for me to kind of come and say, oh, I think this is the one. Like. But I think that what this is doing is that, you know, this talk about evolution versus revolution. We sometimes talk in our, our nerdiest, wonkiest innovation studies days about the role of big events in disrupting stable paradigms, right? That, that you have all these little companies doing neat little experiments, but they can't grow very quickly or very easily. Like it takes a really long time unless something changes in the world right that really like allows a big industry like i look at chemicals or construction that are big conservative move like dinosaurs 95 percent of the time but then something major happens but it's really hard to say as it's happening which are the ones that are actually going to kind of kind of bubble up to the top 
So I think that I think that more than saying, okay, there's a particular technology and I have my eye on it, is that I'm looking to see how people kind of take a bit of this and a bit of that and and apply it in new ways because they have the space now, right? They're not kind of trying to, to fight their ways out. I think Christina probably has a better sense of within construction what some of those, you know, interesting combinations may be. Um, in a general sense, though, I, I you know, I, I just think that it's the space is there. Like there's this bubble here for for creative things to happen. But I'm I just I I could not come up with like a single technology trajectory where I'm like, that's the one. Because I think every time we try to do that, we're always so wrong. Everyone told me I was going to be out of business from MOOCs like 10 years ago. And I'm like, no, see, I still don't think that's the case, right? I, I still think that like, you know, we get really hyped up about things and, and we tend to be wrong more than we're right. Um, but I think what it did do, for example, is things like the big MOOC experiments of the last 10 years put us in a space for remote schooling and remote conferencing and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. where we had technology platforms and we had ways of doing things that we've been able to adjust in creative ways now. Um, whoever was invested in Zoom like a year ago must cite. <laughs> must be the king now. <laughs> Right. Yeah, so but that would have been even you know who would have known anyway um christina well i can answer um you know you if you want um on what type of technology um and the answer is all of them <laughs> in the sense that to be honest the technology is, though, is already there from you know and we start um you know we, we talk about artificial intelligence machine learning we can talk about blockchain we get we have hammer here in a, as an expert i know um but you know and you know the adoption of all of these amazing you know um type of technologies but the, the the reality is it's about what do we need them for right and what do we want to use them for because um it's um it, what I see at the moment is that if you use this password, and I see it because I work in the early stage startups. So if you have, oh, I'm creating the new AI tool, I'm creating the new ML tool, I'm creating the new, it's, it, this, this going into this hype, right? And this, you know, big technology hype that is it really what we need right now? Uh, might be really good. And to be honest, that's also what you need to use for marketing purposes to, you know, raise that funding that otherwise you're not going to raise. But it's, um, you know, can understand is what are we really using? What, what do we yeah. want to focus on? And what is really the technology that might be the game changer? for us in the construction. Yeah, actually, I mean, before I ask, I ask a specific question about specific technology. Go. You know, like in our center, like we have 15 uh, like research project and we try to combine most of the uh, like um, cutting edge technology from blockchain, IoT, um, digital twin, and even uh, with building information modeling. And like, uh, since Professor Nath is here, and he's actually my uh, best advisor, he usually, in the first bit in our research, we usually need to define the rationale, why we are doing this, you know? And this is actually aligned with what, because it's not just, I need to use this technology because it's, it's kind of like trend. And actually, I mean, we have a paper called like Hive of Real, because we, it's important, you know, to define the technology. But since, okay, we are really good friends in the center with blockchain, so I need to ask you, Christina, what part could blockchain play in shaping the great research from your perspective? Especially, I know you are interested and you have some white paper in that. Um, well, it's, no, it's dig more digital uh, twinning. And yes, just wrote a few articles on blockchain, but I must admit, you are the expert here. <laughs> um, the part that I've been, you know, obviously looking at, is it going to be part of the great reset and part of this post-COVID? I hope so. You are an expert on how much is adopted out there, and I see a mix of you know adoption. I'm not entirely sure. They see the, the opportunity that I see. I can definitely see an opportunity on smart contracts because the opportunity to have someone validating all those contracts and start to streamlining you know that process is definitely a roadblock right now along the life cycle in the construction. We have too many players and there is just too much delay and we just can't you know afford that anymore we don't we just can't afford the bureaucracy 
So who is going to take the bureaucracy, validate the bureaucracy? You know, and we can't even afford, we don't even have profits left to give pay, pay someone, right? So how can they say, they, I think, could be an opportunity from the blockchain point of view. Um, but is it going to be immediate? I still have not seen a real amazing game changing um, adoption. But have you? <laughs> and that actually we are here and because of that i know like a professor nat when he like listen blockchain he should say something so okay give you like the life now uh, it is interesting to uh, listen to this uh, debate or discussion actually uh, there are quite uh, interesting points of view coming about uh, uh, christian you brought the point about uh, uh, how to remove the bureaucracy in this process this is exactly why we think blockchain is a very good uh, solution because it is a way to democratize the, the marketplace and give the power to the people who are directly dealing with it, cut the middleman out and directly come into the uh, process. So that, that is a way in which we can, te technology can be used to increase trust because uh, uh, you can't fault the blockchain. It is, I mean, nothing is impossible. Having said that, uh, it will be very difficult to fault the blockchain. Uh, at the same time, it gives us the opportunity to the, uh, uh, make the marketplace fair and direct. And, and that is a, a good thing, I think, in, in the current social context that we are thinking about. Another, uh, Another point I want to put into this mix for this discussion is that uh, uh, you all can respond to as well, is the point about AI. We talk about AI quite a lot. Actually, my, I did my PhD in AI, uh, applying AI, so I was a proponent of AI in, in that sense. Uh, but uh, it, it, it you, there, are, there is a positive and negative side of AI. We all talk about how, what uh, wonderful things AI does, but it is at the same time has a negative impact because it is impinging on our personal liberties. And, and we, uh, it is also affecting uh, the, the way in which we are working, the labor forces, uh, labor force and uh, uh, impact on skills, and a lot of other uh, impacts are there. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking like the uh, Terminator uh, situation and things like that. These are not 100% hypothetical now because uh, imagine uh, what would you th think about uh, the, uh, the situation that came about from uh, uh, the film uh, Contagion. Contagion <laughs> was shown in, in 2011 or 12, isn't it? Uh, it, uh, it's, it's a film, fantastic. We watched it, forget about it. But I just watched recently again, it is exactly what is happening right now. What's the difference? It's, it's I mean, so these uh, movies are really good in this sense because <laughs> these give us, they are not just uh, done uh, without thinking. There's a lot of research goals behind that in order to produce that. And they are some way predicting, but uh, I'll stop at that. Just <laughs> to keep actually, some... I need just to add something, but I will not uh, like elaborate more because this is actually our uh, uh, like uh, like uh, uh, surprise for uh, the next round table here in the center because we will share okay, also uh, live that our uh, experience with the blockchain test check, which is the first one here in New South Wales, okay, and how we had you know like. Uh, like uh, actual output that have been, you know, uh, published by uh, official Hyperledger uh, website. But I'm gonna speak more to keep you like excited about that event to like to stay in our um, uh, keeping good eyes and our bit. Back to you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Please. I mean, just uh, the reason that I am here today and that I know Priya is because I am actually with one of my students, Vishnu, who I think is is watching right now. He is actually doing his work on understanding in a non-science fiction way the different sorts of risks that AI poses in the construction industry. And this includes business risk, it includes, you know, and financial risk, but also 
physical risks, you know, if you're thinking about these on construction sites, the issues with algorithms, and the issue to labor force and the social disruption, right? So I think that, um, and once again, as soon as we started looking in the construction industry, there's nothing. There is nothing written about this. There is nothing studied about this, right? There's there's like tiny little bits about about what could happen, but um, you know, and there's a huge amount of being discussed in in the finance sector and other places around. And I mean, open up open up a British newspaper today, and everyone's screaming about how the use of algorithms to to distribute A level scores, you know, did or didn't entrench existing inequities in the system. Um, and in some ways, it's great that we're having that conversation, but I'm really glad I didn't, wasn't supposed to take my A-levels or had a child who was supposed to take my A-levels this year, right? No. Oh. Like, COVID oh. is bad enough, right? But so I guess the thing is, is that this is, this is part of the challenge with figuring out what technologies are going to work, because there's a regulatory aspect to this, and even things that might get hot might actually not be a great idea. Um, yeah, absolutely. And before I like, uh, give you like, a other question, uh, Kara, like, I, I feel like Professor Mike is uh, like interesting to add something. So, Professor Mike, can you add like, your, your <laughs> just his views about that? I'd, I'd be interested to find out how perceptive you were and in, uh, in, in uh, guessing that I had something to say. Uh, but thank you anyway, uh, Amara. I better, um, yeah, I better, I guess, uh, say something there. I think the issue is with any new technology, there's always uh, a raft of issues that need to be considered. And, uh, and it's one of those where uh, the technology is sometimes it seems so far away and then suddenly it's just in front of you. And I think yeah. what's happening at the moment is a, a lot of the issues we've been researching for the last 20 or 30 years. And we felt that in terms of an implementation cycle, they will need another 20 years. So suddenly that implementation cycle has been compressed to a, a very few months. So nobody has really had the time to process, to design, to do all the things that you would normally do in a normal cycle in terms of the S-curve. So what we're doing at the moment is we, we went from the bottom to the top in uh, the space of three or four months. We've done the same in, in higher education, in universities, we're doing the same in almost every other industry. So I think it is right that, um, you know, we take the stock of what happened and ask questions about the validity of those. But inevitably, I think we have to uh, act. And I think the industry, the construction industry is acting, is taking actions and they're taking it one step at a time. And I guess that's why it's important for us uh, academics to reflect on that, investigate it, and also uh, come up with uh, the evidence of what actually happened. At the same time that I think we pay very close attention to how the industry is operating, so learning uh, from practice. So I have a, a slightly more um, relaxed view, I guess, about uh, new technology and implementation. I think uh, people in the sector would always find a way of innovating. And I think in a crisis, normally the innovation path is much, much faster. So I very much look forward to, on the one hand, seeing how the industry is operating now, but learning also uh, from it in the future. Thank you, Professor. And taking a cue from you, we will just shift our last couple of questions to, um, to being part of universities that we are all are. So, uh, Professor Kira, what do you think are the most essential skill sets for future graduates to be part of this digital transformation? Well, so I have, I mean, myself, I, I, my background is, is not in, in AI and computing, but it was, you know, I started in science and moved towards social science. And you know, and I actually have, I was told a lot that it's a lot easier in my case to teach, you know, a chemist, political science and a political science chemistry. But on the other hand, I think that, that the technical skills around things like the programming and, and all of the kind of, like I'm at a university of science and technology. So the things that 85% of our students are doing and studying, you know, we talk a lot about workforce ready and, and all of this stuff. But the fact of the matter is, is that whatever we teach them on that sense, today is going to be out of date in five years or three months in the case of these S-curves, you know, collapsing. And so the important skills are the ability to train and relearn, right, to be able to, to keep up um, so that uh, you are able to constantly kind of update your skills, be able to, to search for that and, and know and kind of adjust and, and be creative. And I think that so that's part of it, right? So the idea is that it, it's not just taking the right class 
right now. It's using your university time as a foundation to become a very agile actor wherever you're going, because there's no way. Universities have no way to train you for a 35 year career when we can't figure out any of us what's gonna happen in two years. I mean, who would have predicted this, right? And so, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that I think that this has shown what, what universities have been trying to scream for years on end, which is that we actually, like it's great to be really great at doing digital design, but to do really beautiful digital design or digital, digital art, you have to understand the world, right? The best art in the world isn't the best art in the world just because they were really fabulous at their technique with paint or had the right brushes or the right sorts of canvas. The best artists in the world are the best artists in the world because they had technique and they had vision and they understood and were trying to express something about the world. And so not just being excessively technically competent, but actually taking the time to think about what am I doing? What are the impacts? What is this doing to society? What is the society I want to see, right? not just taking so much comfort in the technology, but saying, once again, this technology is a tool. My ability to use this is a tool to paint on this canvas to create the world we want going forward. And that requires the social knowledge, the humanities, right? The appreciation for other parts of life. And so I think that one of the things that universities, when they're doing their job well, what that we're able to do is at least impart some of that importance and, and encourage students to keep that as some part of who they are, right? We're not just out there to have you be Excel spreadsheet automatons for your next 40 years of your life. And, and I, I think that that often gets lost. I'm a huge proponent of STEM and yet some of the STEM discussions really disturb me because they act as if that it's okay if no one ever reads philosophy again. Um, and, and I find that concerning, right? Um, you know, and the same thing, like if you're, if you're going into genetics and genomics and you don't have a good sense of what it is you're doing, why, and maybe where some lines might be, you know, you do get into potentially into trouble. And the same with a lot of these other technologies in industries like chemicals or constructions or whatever they may be. If you get so blinkered uh, into the technical aspect and the technical excellence, you might not see what's happening off to the side. And we need systems thinkers, right? This whole question about resilience um, in the future and COVID, right? Who would have thought that a global, you know, a pathogen, a virus was gonna cause this kind of massive technical shift in the construction industry and all these other industries we see, right? That requires a degree of being able to scan the world. Not that anyone should have necessarily predicted it per se, but the ability to scan and then adapt appropriately, I think is really important. And that's a set of skills that requires knowledge beyond just being really great at programming or really great at financial modeling or really great at architecture or whatever it may be that your area is in this space, right? Um, that we need people to understand that they need to have a better grip on the world uh, in order to be able to respond appropriately and plan and develop and have great innovations too, right? So that's, that's my plug for why academia might still matter in the future, even if I have to teach everyone on Zoom for the rest of my career, um, <laughs> which is kind of my nightmare, but you know, only yeah, because I really enjoy my students in my classroom. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Ked. Actually, like this is something what we try to do here at the, in the, the CIB student chapter at the Center for Sound and Construction, like to give that different taste, okay, or like different different pathway, okay, or like I mean, uh, as a part of uh, the University of Sydney. So uh, the last question in our schedule to you, Christina, and back to construction industry. What are the opportunities and challenges for future graduates in construction uh, digital transformation? Well, first of all, um, congratulations in choosing, honestly, the best career um, that I think exists out there. Um, because uh, for someone who has been in the industry for a long time, you know, honestly, the combination of tech with the built environment is just the best, okay? And the fact that um, we are the one who design what the world looks like. And what I found fascinating, and Kira, me and Kira never spoken to before this, you will never believe what, what I'm going to about to say, because it's um, sort of, I've been talking about a lot about, you know, what happened in technology is going to, you know, benefits and challenges, what really is going to be the game changer. And there is, you know, the digital twin opportunity, yeah, we already discussed, you know, earlier, and I, you know what, I think as a concept and the ability to have our digital replica connected with our bit assets, yes, long term, it's, you know, it's a huge, huge opportunity. And what I found interesting is that obviously there's this huge international debate 
on what the digital twin for the built environment actually is and what is not and what should be called the digital twin is not. And as a part of the debate, I actually published a paper last year on what is a digital twin, but I decided to get away from that and, and clone my own um, definition, which is we are all the artists of the built environment uh, who carefully select the materials to be applied. And a digital twin is the combination of the canvas and the integrated inherent understanding of our existing built assets and how they interact with the previous and the future generations. So exactly what you were saying, you know, Kira, in the fact that, you know, this is our canvas, yeah? This is, you know, we are the one who design all of this and we are the users as well. I mean, we are the beneficiaries of our built environment and we use it, you know, in terms of, you know, residentials and, you know, commercials and, you know, publics and, and it's our opportunity, you know, it's, it's, honestly, we have the best job because we get to decide, you know, um, what it looks like, but we really need to be able, you know, as I say, as you say, the combination, you know, of the two is um, academia, you know, you are talking to someone, I started as a, uh, land surveyor in 1998 okay and so it's been I've been around for a long time in the industry and I did do three academic degrees while working full-time okay so you have someone who is actually run the two careers in parallel and I think the reason why I did that is um, because obviously I always want to improve and I always want better but also I think you get the best of both and, and I think we need to accept that the old days where you just work and you study and then you go into um, a job and you keep that, it's probably gonna change. And there are many theories where we think, you know, it's gonna be the new work environment, it's gonna be four days of working and one day of learning because the fast pace, you know, how things are changing is just gonna be so fast. So I think what we have to do is probably um maybe you know even conjoin and work together even a bit more and i think you know this um you know part chat is exactly what that i'm learning you know from you and you're learning from me and you know and i think it's more of what we need academia and industry exchange mm -hmm. um and um you know honestly and you know to answer your opportunity you have the best opportunity ever uh to be part of um, you know, of what this world looks like and how it's uh, obviously uh, designed, maintained and built. Challenges. You are the ones who need to see things differently and you need to bring this new heart, you know, set of eyes that it's, um, it's very difficult for the people that be, are been in the industry for so long to do things differently. And the challenge that you have is trying to tell us, you know what, I think we can do it differently and justify why you think we can do things differently and we're gonna see benefits. Because, and, and also stick to what you think because it's so easy to give up. I see so many people coming out of the industry because they just say, they just said enough, they didn't find it exciting. You have to compromise all the time and you're working with people that, you know, there is a huge, huge debate, and, you know, in differences. And, you know, Kira earlier was, you know, brought that up, even simple things like his signature, you know? And, you know, sometimes it's, uh, it's very difficult. I work with people that, you know, I remember years ago, they were still writing letters. And it's very, you know, but they will get the job done. So for them, it's very difficult to accept to adopt something different. And so the challenge that you have is, um, you know, be received <laughs> and trying to bring, you know, teach us there is a better way because you have a new eyes that we don't necessarily have. But we have the experience. <laughs> <laughs> actually, it's such a, like a relief and positive vibes, okay, during the COVID. And especially, actually, I mean, today, Prof. Mike, is, I mean, this is the first event with us as a dean for our built environment. So that means this is where the, the college should produce more, you know, like more uh, money and, and uh, achievement. However, okay, we have a couple of questions. We have uh, one question 
from the webinar that we will take from the audience. We have with us Dr. Shasha Alexander, who is a DAP, Director of Programs for Undergraduate Industrial Design. And he asks, so how well are we equipped to respond in agile ways as an industry in anticipating trends and planning for sustainable legacies? So any of our guests would like to take this question. Even Professor Mark, if you wanna. Yep. Christina, Professor Sina, Kero. Should I say something while you yep. guys are thinking? Okay. Um, <laughs> I think I think it's a really interesting question. And uh, uh, normally uh, the industry changes when there's a reason to change. And uh, some companies are taking some small steps. Uh, but normally in construction, it's very difficult to find somebody to pay for the research and development. So, and because we're a project-based organization, normally we have to charge the R&D within our existing projects. And that's always a misconception between a, in the sector, because if you look at globally at the R&D investment in construction, it's a very small um, element because is calculated in a very different way to what you would do in a normal uh, research and development organization. So I think, I think the sector is, is ready to pick up and innovate. And uh, depending on the size of the problem and when you have more complex problems, then the sector will innovate more. Um, uh, so that's, that's my understanding of it. But I think as a sector, we have a role to play in the sector. So I see higher education has been uh, a component of the sector, not something that sits outside of it, but actually that is together as an embedded part uh, of that collaboration. And that's why in particular, um, the center that we have here at Western Sydney is a very important one because working with the industry, we're able to um, help the sector take the next steps forward for the next two, three, five, and 10 years. Yeah. I have another question, yeah. I agree. Um, you know, I just, are we right? <laughs> Probably not, but we have to be now. I don't think we have a choice. It's, um, it's, um, it's, a, it's a unique opportunity. It's time to really set our, uh, you know, that um, invest in the research and development. It's time now and we, you know, we don't have a choice. Yeah, could we have another question? I guess we are almost on the verge of our time. So because of constraints, we'll not be able to take another question, but our speakers and our, um, our director and Dean, everybody is on LinkedIn. So just get in touch with them uh, for more questions. But before that, I'd like to invite uh, Buddhini. She is our vice president of the CIB student chapter for a um, vote of thanks. Thank you, Priya, Amar, and the panelists for the fabulous session. Summing up the live chat on collective sense making, I would like to thank Professor Mike, the Dean of the School of Built Environment, for joining with us today. Professor Mike stated at once that sometimes technology seems to be far away and suddenly they are in front of you. This is definitely food for thought in conducting research on technology. Thank you for your encouragement, and we are truly honored to have you here, Professor. Also, thank you, Professor Srinath, for the support given to us to make our thoughts a reality. The CIB student chapter has come a long way hand in hand with the Center for Smart Modern Construction. The thoughts on how we have become reliant on harnessing the power of digital models and collective intelligence is definitely impressive. And I'm sure we have more debates to do in resolving issues related to blockchain, artificial intelligence, impact of technology on skills and whatnot. It is interesting how Kira and Christina shared their views on the Great Reset. We are facing unprecedented events, taking business as usual into a new normal, or rather, I'd say business as unusual. My key takeaways, <laughs> yeah, my key takeaways from today's fireside chat are enormous. First, I would like to note how Kira mentioned that policy has become a platform for resilience development as opposed to regulation development. We experience new awareness about sustainability, vulnerability, and skills change. This needs to be taken seriously now more than ever. Christina, while joining us amidst, amidst lockdown in Melbourne, highlighted how adapting with digitalization and innovation is the only way forward. 
we have to do more with less. I think it's one of the best ways to work the current scenario. Lastly, I'm grateful for the inspiring executive committee of the CIB student chapter. Thank you, Lavender, for connecting with us all the way from China. Thank you very much, Kazun, for having an eye for detail. When it comes to our marketing campaign, you are constantly one step ahead. And Amar, thank you for always coming up with the brilliant, innovative ideas. I'm not sure what you will think for our next event, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be wonderful. Finally, Priya, this is a very big thank you from all of us for steering our committee in the right direction, a true leader indeed. Thank you all for joining with us. See you again at our live chat next, consecutive, next for the Collective Sense Making webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Buddhi. That was a very nice word of thanks. I really enjoyed it. Thank uh, you so much for inviting me. This is great. Yeah, thank you. It was an absolute thank pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mike, for being with us today. I know we are just moving in from the farewell of our uh, previous dean to this uh, event today. So it's been a full day. Thank you so much for being here with us. And thank you, Professor Srinath. You are always behind us and the CIB student chapter exists today because of your enthusiasm. You just came one day and said, should we have a chapter and instill that motivation in us to just go ahead, right? <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you for joining Collective Sense Making. See you again soon. Thank you, Amer, for being the perfect co-host. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations thank you, to you. Well done. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Professor Na. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Craig. Signing yeah. off and good night from Sydney. And uh, have a nice weekend. Have a nice weekend. Bye bye. bye, -bye. See you soon. Bye bye. See you soon.